We love some good vaccine data, and we were pretty excited to see a new long-term study published this month on cervical cancer outcomes after the HPV vaccine. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Just over 10 years ago, in response to claims that the HPV vaccine did nothing to prevent cervical cancer and worse, that it was hurting people, we put out a video to straighten out the facts. Mainly that it was incredible and life-saving. The first HPV vaccine became available in 2006. The vaccine guards against human papillomaviruses, or HPV, a group of over 200 viruses. Two types of HPV cause genital warts, and somewhere around 12 can cause different types of cancer. In fact, HPV infection causes almost all cervical cancers, almost all of them. Among the nine HPV strains targeted by the current vaccine, it protects against two of the high-risk HPVs that account for approximately 70% of cervical cancers. It's amazing. It's also a big deal because a lot of people encounter HPV. Worldwide, it's the most common sexually transmitted infection, with more than 80% of people becoming infected in their lifetime. In many cases, the virus will clear on its own with no major repercussions. However, in up to 20% of women, the infection does not clear, and this is where the cervical cancer can come in. In that decade-old video we made on the topic, and it's amazing that healthcare triage has been around that long, we addressed the claim that one of the original researchers of the HPV vaccine had spoken out against it. We clarified that she had actually just aired concerns about the vaccine not being around long enough to make strong claims about its ability to maintain long-term HPV immunity and thus prevent associated cancers. This was a reasonable concern given the length of time that generally takes place between getting the vaccination as an adolescent or young adult and the occurrence of cervical cancer later in life. We needed enough time to monitor the vaccine's potency in the long run and to determine if any kind of booster was necessary. Well, we've had some of that time. It's been a decade, and now we've got some data. To the research. Published in January of 2024 in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, this study examined data from approximately 450,000 women born in Scotland between January 1st, 1988 and June 5th, 1996, looking at whether they were vaccinated, how many doses they got, and what age they were when they got them, and of course, the incidence of cervical cancer. In women who had been immunized at 12 or 13 years old, presumably before they became sexually active, no cases of invasive cancer were recorded, which did not appear to depend on how many doses they had received. No cases. For women vaccinated between 14 and 22 years of age, presumably after many of them had become sexually active, the incidence of cervical cancer was 3.2 cases per 100,000 women compared to women who had never received a vaccine where incidence was 8.4 cases per 100,000 women. So still a clear reduction in cases. Importantly, women in the 14 to 22 age group had to have received all three recommended doses of the vaccine to see these benefits. This is not to say that cervical cancer would never arise in women vaccinated early on, particularly given that the first vaccine didn't target as many HPV strains as the currently available vaccine. In fact, we fully expect that we'll see some cases in these groups as more long-term data come to light. But still, what we can say is that the vaccine clearly appears to provide long-term immunity and thus considerable protection from deadly conditions like cervical cancer a cancer that is now highly preventable thanks to a vaccine. What a world. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this other episode on how more people should get the HPV vaccine. We'd appreciate it if you'd like this video. Subscribe to the channel down below. Consider going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage where you can help support the show, make it bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Edward Lillehome, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam 